Hello again. In part two, we're going to look at the characteristics of complex systems that we have come to understand through the theories of complexity. Let me remind you. Um, what we looked at in the first video were the group at the top, connectivity, interdependence, feedback and emergence. We will build on those to look at the others. But let me first of all introduce you to some of the theories of complexity that have come from the natural sciences, because they have all contributed to our deep understanding of complex systems. So that understanding has come from um, chemistry and physics, through evolutionary biology, autopoiesis, uh, biology and cognition, and chaos theory, and from economics based very much to begin with on the work of Brian Arthur. So what we will look at now is the contribution that these theories have made to help us develop and understand much further the four principles I discussed in the first video. So let's start with self-organization. In biology, this is an example of self-organization, birds flocking. Um, they do not um, have a particular leader they um, know um, um, where they're flying and so on. But what does that actually mean in a human context? And this is where I think we need to keep making that distinction of what is appropriate, what is relevant in a human context, because we cannot always take something from the natural sciences and apply them directly to a human um, system. So. Self-organization in a human context is, first of all, is something which is spontaneous, is a coming together that has not been um, uh, pre-thought uh, and it's not directed or designed by someone outside the group. That is very, very important. Now, let me give you an example. During the Arab Spring, there was a point when someone took a broom and went to Taya Square and started cleaning up the square simply because the square needed cleaning. No one actually told that person. And of course, when one person started, others joined him. Now that was pure self-organization. It was spontaneous. There was a job that needed to be done. Someone decided that they could do the job and it was not directed by anyone outside, and the group that eventually cleared the square um, were not directed. Now, this is quite different from um, self-management. A self-organized group decides what needs to be done, how and when, and it can be a great source of innovation. In self-management, we have something different. A senior manager would probably identify a particular group, will give them a particular objective, but then give them the freedom to address it in whichever way they want. Can you see the difference between the two? In the second one, the self-managed one, there is someone outside the group that actually directs the group um, uh, what to do. Not necessarily how to do it, but what to do. So it is not spontaneous and it is directed from outside. So let's keep that distinction um, in mind and go on to the next principle. The next principle is called exploration of the space of possibilities. What that means is it's simply that the system um, explores new options, different ways of working and relating because it has found a particular constraint that will not allow it to um, fulfill uh, a particular objective um, the way that it may have been uh, pre-planned. So for example, um, your grandmother is dying, you love her dearly, you really want to be there with her, but your flight is cancelled. What are you going to do? You can, of course, do absolutely nothing. That's one option. But if you really want to see her, you will explore the space of possibilities and find a way of getting there to actually be with your um, grandmother. And that is what complex systems do. They are very good at finding new ways of doing things. Now, let me explain something else. This is a fitness landscape. We borrow this idea from biology. And what it shows is that a very successful species has 
climb to the very top of the highest peak because it has got a, a very successful strategy. Now imagine that as the strategy of a very successful company. It has that one very successful strategy that has put it to the very top and nothing else. What happens when the entire landscape actually changes? Because that fitness landscape does not stand still. It is moving all the time. If you know what um, a, a children's bouncy castle looks like, it is that's the way to imagine it. As the children jump up and down the bouncy castle, the, it changes all the time. And that is how to imagine a fitness landscape. So if we cannot rely on one successful strategy, what's the answer? Okay. The answer is multiple micro strategies. And let me explain why that is the case. We are um, encouraged to think of a single optimum strategy. But I would suggest that a single optimum strategy is neither possible nor desirable in a changing or turbulent environment because it can only be optimal under one set of circumstances. When those circumstances change, it is no longer optimal. So what do you do? And as I said, the answer here is while the, the, that one strategy is successful, you need to explore different micro strategies and then do different experiments um, in order to see what works. So when your big strategy fails, you have already worked out, experimented with alternatives. And this is, of course, absolutely essential for innovation. So that is the principle of exploration of the space of possibilities. And that is something that complex systems um, do very well indeed. The next principle is called co-evolution. Now, most of you will be familiar with the term evolution. But evolution happens within a, um, an ecosystem with relation to other things. And th the principle I will explain to you is far more accurate than just evolution. In this case, um, we have an example in biology and we look at bumblebees and the flowers that they pollinate. Now they have co-evolved so that both have become dependent on each other for survival. So this is the definition in biology. What does it mean in a social context? By the way, it took us two years to actually understand what does coevolution mean in, in a social um, ecosystem. And I will use the term ecosystem because I want to emphasize the fact that nothing evolves in isolation. It is part of a bigger picture. Let me give you an example. I take a decision or action that affects you. It affects you to such an extent that you have to change your behavior in response to my decision or action. Now that is simple adaptation. What you're doing is adapting to changes in your environment. That's only half the story. However, if your change decision or action in due course comes back and affects me to such an extent that I also have to change my behavior. That's co-evolution. So let's look at the definition. The definition is reciprocal influence, which changes the behavior of the interacting entities. And it is a very, very powerful dynamic because um, what it means is that we can not just um, think about the impact of the environment um, on individuals and organizations on societies because the moment they start changing their behavior, that behavior will go back and, and influence um, the initiator of the change. Um, so this is co-evolution which happens within a social ecosystem. And the final one I want to discuss with you because I think it brings all of the characteristics together is 
far from equilibrium. The original work, which was done on dissipative structures uh, by Ilya Prigozhin and with his um, uh, co-workers Nicolis and Stengers, um, he, it won Ilya Prigozhin the Nobel Prize because he reinterpreted the second law of thermodynamics. We're not going to go into the second law of thermodynamics. What we are actually going to look at is what does far from equilibrium mean in a human context. And let me give you another example. As you may recognize there, you will see the two screens. And again, it is our global financial system when it went, when it tumbled down. So let me explain what happened there. When a system is pushed far from equilibrium, it means that it can no longer carry on under its previous um, way of operating. You will see that the system is dynamically moving um, within a cer certain um, limits. But what happens is when there is a disturbance outside the system, that means it can no longer continue to function in its old way. This is called pushing the system far from equilibrium. In human terms, it means um, that it has to change its, its, its norms, its organizational structure, its culture, etc., etc. But let us look at what the science actually tells us. There is a point um, in the second part of the diagram, and that is called a point of bifurcation. Bifurcation means splitting into two. But that is only a very great simplification of what actually happens. Because at that point, at that critical point, the system, the complex system, will explore its space of possibilities, will continually explore different options. Because if it doesn't find another way of operating, it will die. So what that simple bifurcation shows is it will either create new order. Remember at the very beginning, I said that a complex system has the capacity to create new order. And this is what I mean. It uses all its characteristics to create something new. It could be a new structure, a new way of relating, a new way of organizing, a new culture, but it needs to do something completely different in order to survive. And if it cannot create that new order, then it will die. But what happens at that point um, is very, very exciting. And let me also point out that um, even though we talk about a point, it could be a process. It could take days, months, years for that exploration to actually take place. So what happens is when a system is pushed far from equilibrium, the following characteristics come into play to create the new order. It will self-organize. It will explore um, possible solutions. It will co-evolve. New structures will emerge. There will be a sense of coherence. But also the precise behavior can neither be predicted nor controlled. Now, this is a very <laughs> disturbing conclusion, um, especially when we're looking at complex systems. When we're looking at complex systems that we actually want um, to um, design. And one um, thing I want to make very clear is to give you a distinction between complicated systems and complex systems. Complicated systems, we can design, we can predict their behavior, and we can control their behavior. Now, that, these are systems, for example, like producing um, a glass. We know exactly what we're producing, but we cannot do these things with a complex system. We may try to um, design it, but we cannot quite predict the outcome. So the, the behavior is not predictable, nor is it controlled. And in our third video on the challenges 
of managing complex systems, we will then look at what is it that we can actually do if we cannot um, design, predict and control a complex system. Thank you.